Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your host, Greg Thompson, and I am joined by more than my partner in crime. We we have a, a quadrant of, of crime fighting. Wait, criminals? Does that make it for criminals? Infamous. Uh, in, at least. Yeah, infamous <laughs> quadrant. Uh, so we'll start. Aaron, how are we doing, man? I'm great, man. What a day. We're, we're oh. going to get into it all, but... Uh, the Bills do, dealt me a blow yesterday with the releases, and I was a little bit mad that, that cloud was hanging over me, but Brandon Bean saved the day, and the Bills got better uh, early here before free agency starts, so we can get into that in a little bit. Oh, So, from anyone who doesn't listen to the hoof, you're a crazy person, but for our man Sterling, how we doing? Man, I'm I'm over here on cloud nine, man. I, I <laughs> can't say that I thought Milano was going to sign, but I will go ahead and give you credit that you did call... The contract. So I'm going to give you some love on that. I, I do some math on occasion. I do some math on occasion. Like Anthony, how are we doing, sir? I'm bored. There's just no, like, <laughs> Bills news. And then the ones that, like, the news that is dropping, it's just not impactful. Like, I want some kicker news, like the Bears. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, obviously, um, we had planned and we will go into our free agent wish list. We're going to play a bit of a game here later on, but it, it's crazy not to start with our man Matt Milano re signing on an extension. We saw the moves in the previous days. You know, obviously the release of Quentin Jefferson and Ver John, uh, John Brown, you know, really causing some debate. You know, the retention of uh, Vernon Butler at a reduced rate. Being able to get some money back from from Morse and, and those different things, and everybody was kind of debating. Okay, we created maybe twenty million dollars in cap space. What are they going to do? I, you know, Aaron and I have talked about it for shows leading up to now. We both talked about some paths, but you know, we'll start with you, Sterling. Did, what did you think the odds were that we were going to see Matt Milano back in a Bills uniform? None. And it's like uh, breaking up with your girlfriend and getting your CDs back. I thought it was over. I thought That's it was a, a wrap. <laughs> you got the hoodie. You got the hoodie. Yeah, you got my hoodie. You got my CDs. I think we're done now. <laughs> Can I get them back or no? But, uh, dude, I, I – it's it's cool. I mean, I think, you know, they love their draft picks. Brandon Bean loves oh. his draft picks. Or McDermott, they love their guys. And that's why Vernon Butler's here for mm. – God dang, get rid of him. <laughs> but – I mean, I can't complain. It means we don't have to draft a linebacker first round. So how many how many mock drafts are thrown out the window now that had whichever linebacker there? Aaron, we had talked about it for a bit here. You know, you, you would maintain maybe a little more optimism than some, fo some folks, but I don't know that you expected this today. No, and I think we talked about it a little off air here that I expected if the market – wasn't what he thought it was going to be. And I think that is the case here. I think he had some illegal tampering where his representatives were talking to people around the league and the deals that were coming back or the, the numbers that were getting thrown out probably weren't far off from where the bills were still trying to negotiate with him. And he made the determination here. And you heard uh, Justina Anderson talk about culture mattering to him and his representatives bringing that up over and over again and a chance to win. I expected that scenario to play out like you had said maybe like a two year deal or something. Yeah. I didn't expect this type of good deal for both the bills and Milano to come to fruition where now he's back for four years. Uh, th this is a fantastic deal for the bills. Keep this young core together. I think you and Eric nailed it, that there was ways to replace the production for sure. less money and get close to that production. But then you're relearning so much uh, with a brand new guy. I think being able to keep Milano, hopefully now keeping Taron Johnson uh, where he's he is and maybe adding a cornerback, you have sure. everything right back where it needs to be in communication. And that's a huge investment to be able to get that all back before free agency starts. Clears that draft board, like Sterling said. We don't have to worry about that in the draft anymore. This position's addressed. Check it off the list. Let's roll into 2021. I can't wait. So, Anthony, I know on your show when I came on with you, we talked about some of these numbers, and I think we're pretty darn close to what this came out to here. It, you know, you were talking about it before the show, not only to get him at the value that he did, but also at a beautiful number for 2021. Yeah, I, I really thought there was a low probability that he was going to come back at all. I just did the show last night with Bruce and we talked about it like, okay, we're going to have to fill linebacker. Let's go with that platoon aspect, whether it's, you know, bringing in some value signing or finding someone potentially at the end of the first or early second, the Jabril Coxes, Awusu Koromoa, if he fell, all that kind of stuff. And then we get this news that not only is he coming back, but exactly to your point, Greg, that he's coming back at a 
pretty team friendly deal. And especially the way it's structured with what the base salary is for 2021 and then how the signing bonus has been prorated. The cap hit is so low and well structured. And well, it, not so low, but low enough for 2021 for this nuclear winter that we're going into and how they layered it. It's just another feather in the cap for Bean and the fact that he's coming back at all, but the fact that he's coming back and at the value, like it's a tremendous signing because of what yeah. he brings and what he does. But then it, that contract, it also makes it like a value signing. Like we didn't have to break the bank to bring him back. I'm, I'm just shocked on both fronts legitimately, but also extremely happy. Yeah, and for anybody who's wondering, from everything we've seen, I think Sal Capaccio had a couple decent numbers out there. Seven million dollar signing bonus, yep. five point three million in salary in the first year. So yep. then you're talking about you know, like seven point oh five million in cap hit for the first Nothing. year. So um, with even without Lee Smith done yet, and I'm accounting him as kind of a formality here. I think they have another 15 million in cap space right now, roughly, with the other moves. And you know, I still think there's some corresponding moves that could happen if they go after, um, you know, some of the positions we're going to talk about here tonight. If they find an edge rusher they fall in love with, there's another move they can make on the defensive line that, you know, releasing Mario Addison gives like a six million dollar coupon off of that edge rusher and a couple other pieces that can do if they want to. But having 15 million after bringing back Matt Milano is a solid spot that that puts you in the upper third of the nfl as far as cap space and in a year like this with the kind of values that could be going around that's not a bad spot to be in so um what we're going to do tonight is we are going to be the front office of the buffalo bills we will be brandon bean uh joe shane malik Boyd, dan morgan getting together in the room haggling it out to figure out who are the pieces that we want to go after and Aaron Sterling and Anthony are going to make their case. I'm going to be the, the, uh, coin flip decider of what we're going to do. (laughs) And we'll see what our uh, choices are at each of the positions. As we dive in, we will start with what I think is the most important position because it involves the one protecting one and only Joshua Allen. We're going to start with offensive tackle. Um, We'll start with uh, Aaron here. What is your case for who we should go after at offensive tackle? This one's the easiest one of the night, in my opinion. Let's go bring Daryl Williams back. Let's get it done. That's my top priority. I'm trying to figure out how to get a deal similar to what Milano gets. Hopefully it's a similar situation where he goes out there. I don't think it will be because I think he's probably the top tackle, right tackle available. So somebody's willing probably to overpay him. So it's going to come down to – having to go somewhere where you're probably not going to win a lot of games and get overpaid and just take that money or make maybe substantially less and play here in Buffalo. But I think we're going to have a shot at a title here in the next two years. And I think you're going to be a cornerstone piece of that. I don't know if that's enough to sway him, but I'm putting as much effort into that position as I can outside of the draft. I think if we can't get Williams back, I think we can replace him with a, a day one starter in this draft without having to move from that 30 spot. Uh, but the, my option is get him back and check another thing off the list and roll in with that continuity. Sterling, what is your case for offensive tackle? So I also had Daryl Williams, but Ooh. I will say this. Okay, <laughs> I will say this. Just for shits and giggles here, I'm going to go Mitchell Swartz, but let me okay. go back to uh, Daryl Williams for a second. This is the first time that he's actually going to be able to test his value and, you know, for agency without coming yeah. off an injury year. So I think he his price range, what do you guys think? What, 12 to $15 million? I that's mean, probably that's what the market gonna... rate is right. in a normal year. In right. a normal mm-hmm. year, that's what the market is. I think it's tough to know in this year, is that going to be out there with now Eric Fisher, Mitchell Schwartz, Riley Reef all getting released in the last couple of days um, with a little bit of competition there. I think that he had a better season than those guys did. For sure. But some of them have a little longer stretch of sustained health that he's sure. in that top group, but arguably the top one. Uh, I'm not sure if that... I'm not sure if anyone gets that number this year out of that group. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would, we all would assume he's probably going to get the most money yeah, as a I right I for sure tackle. could see that. So I, I would say, you know, we're probably going to lose him seeing that we re-signed Matt Milano. So Mitchell Swartz comes in. I think PFF graded him as like a 74 overall offensive tackle. He's decent in pass protection. I mean, he's a guy, a stopgap guy. You know, if you want to, uh, like, if you want to go to the draft and get a, a starting right caliber tackle, you can do that. But Mitchell Swartz, I'd, lo- I'd love to make him. his brother Jeff have to say nice things about the Bills. That'd be hysterical. Dude, he's he's such a hater. He is such a hater. <laughs> he never wants to admit when he's wrong either. So for for I'll go Mitchell Swartz. 
Okay. But I, I duly noted that you had Daryl Williams there. <laughs> Anthony, what is your case at offensive tackle? Let's just go for Trent Williams and give him 70 minutes. No, no way. I... <laughs> The tackle market now has gotten a little interesting with Schwartz going, Fisher going, Riley Reef getting dipped into the pool a little bit there. Honestly, if even if we're not if we're taking the a holistic picture into the account, I'd like to go offensive tackle in the first round. But since we're talking about free agency here, I'm gonna jump on the Daryl Williams bandwagon. Just the familiarity, knowing what he can do combined with the cost. I think everything is so murky. I don't think He's going to get that 7.8, 7.9 average annual value that Spot Track has him pegged on. He's, it's going to go up a little bit, even though the market has gotten some better tackles over the last several days with those releases. But with what we did for Milano, I don't think we have another huge high priority signing at that spot, especially with what is potentially available in the draft. So I'm pinpointing Daryl Williams just because of what he would cost combined with the familiarity. And if we don't get him, then I'm looking towards the draft unless we somehow to Sterling's point can bring in Schwartz and maybe his cap hit has suddenly dropped a little bit. Same thing for reef, but I don't want to take, I'd rather take a chance on a higher value prospect in the draft than I would a lower caliber free agent to bring in. So give me Darrell Williams, and then if not, I'm looking towards the draft. You can't do that. That's to, against the rules, bro. To the point, it's so, the, it, sorry, bro. <laughs> to the point I make, of the – I make my uh, own rules. <laughs> uh, the point, though, of like uh, I, I still think outside of the starting tackle position, there's also still going to be a need for a swing tackle. Yep. Uh, seki has gone. You're going to need to fill some one of these roles with a lower end free agent. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eric and Greg, you guys had talked about Wagner when he was yep. released from the Packers could be a, a perfect swing tackle where even if you do draft a guy having a guy that has some NFL experience, if he's not ready day one where you can throw, I know that's, Nobody wants to hear it, but similar to like a Brian Winters situation where you have a guy that can play a position, maybe not well, but can yeah. play it. Uh, th- they still need to address that as well. So there's going to be some free agent tackle coming in, uh, whether it's a higher end guy or the, the swing. I would and I, I think that's really going to be the answer here that if we look at the case you guys made, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think that I'm going to assume Daryl Williams does price himself out of our market. I think there's then two choices that I don't think they go into the draft with any glaring holes. Now, glaring hole could mean, uh, I hate to use a Brian Winters caliber answer, but you you know, that, that kind of thing. There are two different areas. So one, do we see one of those guys in the Daryl Williams tier, whether that's Fisher, that's Riley reef, that's Schwartz, um, maybe Alejandro Villanueva. I assume he gets paid. Obviously, Trent Williams gets paid. Maybe Russell Okung, one of those guys. If one of those guys ends up that most of them get 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 million, and then one of them gets left over and there's not a big spender left, and it's, hey, signing on with Buffalo for one year, 6 million, and then figuring it out next year, whoever's the last guy <laughs> left that loses musical chairs, I could see that. I do think that... A Rick Wagner, a Cam Fleming, a Joe Haig, a Cedric Abwehi, one of those kind of guys mm-hmm. is the guy you can get for three million and then target the draft. And that yeah. if the draft ends up a second or third round pick and they're not maybe ready literally day one, you're hoping they can take over as the season goes or you need a whole season of a band aid. I think it could go there. So I'd love to pick Daryl Williams. And after today, maybe I have more hope than, <laughs> than what I did. I know, right? say never. If they structure something <laughs> that's a three-year, $33 million deal for him, but it's a 6 or $7 million cap hit in the first year like they did with Milano, screw it. I, all right. Yeah. Ro- let's roll it back. Um, so it, we'll see where it goes. My guess is you guys are probably closer to that in the sense of value signing plus a draft pick is probably cobbled together there. So we'll, we'll see where that one goes. This discussion will be a little more exciting. We'll start with Anthony this time. Pitch me on a pass rushing edge player. I'm super torn, really torn on this one. I've gone back and forth on it nonstop. So I'm going to give like kind of my two, but I'm going to lean towards the one because I think one of them is going to be mentioned by at least someone else on this panel just because he's in everyone's mind. So Carl Lawson, I don't know if anybody's heard of him. 
somebody may have mentioned him over on Twitter a couple of maybe days ago. I don't know. Talking I saw about some him. pictures of his arms. Yeah, apparently he's <laughs> in good shape. Picture. I printed it out and I, it's, I'm staring at it right now. It's on my wall. Him and uh, pa- him and Powell from Clemson. I'm just yeah. looking at it right now. Yeah. Um, I like Carl Lawson a lot. And what I think is really interesting, Daniel Jeremiah came out over the last several days and mentioned something I thought was very interesting with regards to pass rush, which was speed rushers are fantastic. But in today's day and age with how mobile the quarterbacks are and how fast they're able to get the ball out, rushers that are able to compress the pocket from the outside and go through their man are almost seeing a bit more value. Carl Lawson with his size and stature and the leverage that he's able to generate with his build and his strength. He can do some speed things, but he's got that power. He can get those short arms, but getting the long, a long arm aspect and drive his man back and compress the pocket combined with the raw stats. He was sixth in the entire NFL in pressures last year with 64 fourth amongst all edge rushers. He was 25th in the entire NFL in pass rush grade, ninth pass rush grade amongst all edge rushers. He had a really strong year on a defense and a team in Cincinnati that wasn't really strong with talent. I like him a lot. He's right up there with me. But for the sake of the argument, Hassan Reddick has become a very interesting name for Mm. me because of what he did last year. I recognize the position that he's really been playing in Arizona because their defense is different from ours. And it's more outside linebacker coverage rush type of thing. But last year, was the first season that he was predominantly a rusher. So in his first four years in the NFL, first season, he had 218 pass rush snaps. Second year, 111. Third year, 127. Last year, he had 412 pass rush snaps to only 150 in coverage. They let him come off the edge. And he was tied for fourth in the NFL in sacks in 2020 with 13. For reference, TJ Watt and Donald were first with 15. Granted, five of those for Reddick came in one game against one the Giants. Game. Yeah, but he was tied for 11th in the NFL in pressures, seventh amongst edge defenders in pressures with 56. He had the 12th best pass rush grade amongst all edge defenders, 41st in the for all the NFL in pass rush grade. I think he's going to be a little more expensive than Carl Lawson because of how gaudy and shiny the numbers are. He's someone I'm really keeping an eye on. From a pure value perspective, Carl Lawson's my guy but I've slowly been coming around to Hassan Reddick because I think if we primarily use him as an edge defender, I'm still concerned with him a little bit on setting the edge and being that setting the edge in the run game aspect, but he's a name that's definitely on my radar as well. All right. Duly noted Sterling. What's your pitch? So I'm going to go with Trey Hendrickson. That's that's my dream defensive end prospect. Ooh. I mean, he, he <laughs> is everything that the bills wanted out of Trent Murphy. That high effort, right? Trent like, Murphy, but good. But How good. dare you sully Trent Murphy's I name? I know, right? I know, In man. front of me while I'm here? <laughs> but he, he is, he's what that was supposed to be, and uh, I really like his game. Uh, you know, he's a guy, he's 26 years old, had 14 sacks last season. Uh, he's a, a technician, uses hands well. I think he could be uh, – it could be, you know, really good in the run game. But I would say an underrated guy that people are sleeping on is Leonard Floyd. I think in this defense, oh. he, he's a guy that's versatile, can play linebacker, defensive end. Uh, he, he, you know, playing in Chicago, I think he he wasn't a really good fit for that the defense that they had there. But he really mm-hmm. shined uh, with the Rams last season, and I, I like the way um, the way he plays. He's really good in, in uh and run fits and run defense. He's really good there. And I think that's something that um that we need to shore up a little bit from our defensive ends being able to control and stop the runs. So that's the guy that under the radar guy, I would love to see the Bills take a look at. Aaron. Hi. How are you? Good. I, I'm a, I I got the Carl Lawson picture uh all over and it's all I <laughs> As want. You should. It's uh, beautiful. <laughs> no, and then that's really what I would be shooting for at the position is a player like that for all the reasons Anthony mentioned. He's 25 years old. You can get in on this, make him a key core part of your defense, kind of allow Jerry to pass the torch to who's going to be your long-term uh, get to the quarterback edge rusher. I think you can continue to get guys like Mario Addison to play opposite that uh, over time here and have that one year where, or maybe two years where you have Hughes and Carl Lawson just attacking the passer and then just kind of bring in these other guys to play with them. Outside of that, I, I think I'm pretty much good at, and I don't need to do a lot. I like uh, Sterling's idea of a guy like Floyd, where you could probably get a real good price on him and, and bring him in as a third down 
you know, specialist pin his ears back and get to the passer types thing. But I actually don't hate it being Addison Hughes with Star Latule coming back and Ed Oliver being able to play in step his step forward from Epinesa. Yeah. A yeah. step forward from Epinesa. I, I think maybe you bring in some other of these low end free agents, uh, attack this in the draft too. I'm, I'm not mad if you go after edge in the draft as well. So I, I, it's not a priority to me in the sense that if you don't hit on Carlos and that you got to hit on that next guy in this position, Carl, if you want to come play here and win some titles, we'd love to have you. We'll give you a fair deal. If you don't, we're not going to chase you. Like, it's not that big of a priority, in my opinion. I think changing up some of the scheme, getting guys to play where they're supposed to. I think Ed Oliver playing natural in his position is going to increase the pass rush production all on its own. So I'm not super worried about it getting that much better. It was pretty good last year. We didn't get the sacks, but there were some nice things to build off of already. Add Carl Lawson or bust. That's where I'm at. I actually think Aaron's pitch is the right one. And Mm -hmm. it's not even that it has to be Carl Lawson. I think it's that a lot of the guys you hear thrown around, which are, you know, you've heard Carlos Dunlap, you've heard Justin Houston, Mm -hmm. you've heard Ryan Kerrigan. I'm torn if I throw Leonard Floyd into this camp, but for for this discussion, I'll include Leonard Mm -hmm. Floyd. I don't know that any of those four guys are material upgrades to Mario Addison. Like, people have... PTSD because he didn't have a great season this year. He still had five sacks and had the 38 sacks the four years before. I think that everybody else playing out of position, a better season from Epinesa, a better season from Oliver. I don't know that the results we would get would be much different keeping Addison than getting one of those guys. If they do make a move, I would prefer it's at one of the other ends of the spectrum and that it's a move for a loss and a younger guy that they can grow with for four or five years. Um, maybe, maybe Von Miller. I don't know if he counts as a JJ Watt style mm. move. Aquara, I, I, maybe. Yeah. A Quaro could mm. be a, now a Quaro would be more like Lawson, a guy that you would right. be on a four yeah. or five year deal to grow with the whole time. Um, I, I, so now Liam, who I had on for the Reddit mock offseason show, he's a huge fan of Hendrickson. I give him a hard time that he is Trent Murphy, not even a better version. Oh, um, man. His, yeah, Greg, like, I, Greg hates him, Sterling. I will say, wow. I've he come back around a little bit. Um, some work that Brandon Thorne did on his sack score. The important part is Hendrickson's sack, uh, sack numbers are really inflated. He didn't earn 14 and a half sacks there was a lot of coverage sacks cleanup sacks ones that were just because he was surrounded by cam jordan and other really talented defensive linemen but even if you pair those away it was still nine or ten of his own and that the and that, year that hold on though but that that's better than no no, no, no. Anybody I, on our let, team let me finish let me let me finish so when I was comparing that to the contract year that Murphy had, because Murphy had a 10-sack season with more pressures than what Hendrickson did, if you take away his, it was more like four or five sacks. If you take Jordan Phillips' year with 10 sacks, it was really more like four or five sacks. So the fact that his was 14 and a half, and in reality, if you pair it back, it was still really nine or 10, it's probably better than I was giving him credit for. So he, yeah. I think now my worry is he's going to get paid like a 15-sack guy. And that I don't think he is. I don't think he's going to replicate that. I think he can be good and a good piece of a puzzle. So if he doesn't get that money, I'd be I'd be very much in. The same thing, uh, Anthony, the way that you talked about it, when every fan base has Carl Lawson as their best value edge rusher, he's not going to be a value. No. And that if everybody thinks he's the best value, he's. I won't be shocked if he gets four years and $60 million. If he gets fifteen million a year, just because everybody loves him, right. and that now again, I, I know, you know, obviously I love Mike. Mike Janitti at Spot Track does an awesome job, mm-hmm. and he hits on more contracts than anybody. But I think people flip that into he hits on a hundred percent of the contracts, and he doesn't. Right. Like, you know, I mean, it's just not possible. Even just with the Milano, he had him pegged Correct. at thirteen point eight. Thirteen point eight. So when he put out the eight eight million and change for Carl Lawson, everybody tagged out and like, oh, well, if it's only eight million dollars, I want I that. Take dude. one of those. I want that. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> for sure. I, I will be shocked if that's what that number is. Now, coming back around to our pitch here, I think that's the case. If you can have a material upgrade in youth and explosion, I think that you sign Lawson. I assume Lawson's gonna take twelve million a year oh, to yeah. get. 
Yeah. And that if you're telling me we can do that, but with a young guy his age, you spread it out over five years and do five mm-hmm. years, sixty million, where this year is palatable. Plus this year you get a six and a half million dollar coupon by releasing Mario Addison. I'm in. If it's not one of those guys, I, you know, I fans would be mad. I'd rather just run it back and keep what we got. Hope we get a step forward out of Epinesa, maybe Bam Johnson, and you know, maybe you do take a swing on a guy. I I think the Hassan Reddick is an interesting one because I do think he's better than Addison, but I'm curious, are they going to sign up for a long-term deal with him? He'd be in that range with Lawson and Aquara that I'd be open to it, but yeah. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure where that's gonna where that's gonna land. I my vote would go to Car- Carl Lawson. I, I think that I, I think he would be the pitch that I would make. But I'm worried he's going to be too expensive and they're yeah. going to soak up everything that's there. Even but the if fact you were, that if you were, go ahead. No, you go yeah, ahead. If, You're prettier you than me. JJ uh, Watt, for what we have heard, everybody was kind of around it. JJ Watt at that. That Carl Lawson's a no brainer, as what you just said at the 12 million year. And then you give the same number. Like you said, that's a coupon for half off uh, this year's salary (laughs) cap hit. So (laughs) if you're able to get a player, even though you have these restraints from this COVID weird year that you're going to have in your system for four years, I think you you got it, even though it might be a tough pill to swallow. It's, it's, you can still do it and feel the roster this year and then have that player at at a young player too. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, as an example, if you take Lawson, who, who's only 26, so a five-year deal is perfectly reasonable, um, you do five years for $60 million, you could do a $6 million cap hit for this year, and it's still only $13.5 million over the remaining four years. You prorate that with the signing bonus. Give him a good chunk of money up front where maybe you give him you know, fifteen million in a signing bonus, and then you're spreading that out is only three million a year. You give him a three million dollar salary, but he's getting a fifteen million dollar check plus a three million dollar salary. Right. He gets eighteen million in the first year, and then you make that a palatable, you know, ten million dollar salaries the rest of the way with a thirteen million dollar cap hit. You take a six million dollar cap hit this year, you release Mario Addison, you just got him for Mario Addison's money. Mm. There was no so now the fifteen million that I said we have in cap space, we just use zero of it to add right. Carl Lawson, and we gave him a five year sixty million dollar deal. We just swapped him for Mario Addison with no additional cap hit. If we could do something like that, we, and I honestly, I would do that for Aquara. I would do that for Hassan Reddick. I would do yeah, that for totally for Carl Lawson and get a you know five six seven years younger guy that we can grow with for five years at the same investment. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's like the plan. I think that's important because we are aging at defensive end. Yeah. yeah. But we also are in a position where you can get one of those flex guys, those linebacker defensive end hybrids like Marcus Golden. You know, I yeah. think he, yeah. he would be great, you know. Some of those guys are going to be interesting in that secondary market. Say we don't go there, we leave right, 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 right. Addison. There are some players you could bring in in literally the Trent Murphy role where it's competing with Bam Johnson for that fourth yep. defensive mm-hmm. end and that, you know, it, Vic Beasley's probably looking for a minimum deal. Um, you know, maybe uh, Adrian Claiborne is looking for one more deal. Maybe Everson Griffin has one more season in him. Those are the kind of guys you could bring yep. in on a non guaranteed deal. Be like, hey, if you beat out the kid, you get the roster spot and the money guarantees if you make the 53 man roster. If not, we wish you all the best. We're going to go with Bam. You know, I, or I think that's one you could see as well. Let's just. Let's just throw picks at Minnesota, get Hunter, oh, and oh, just go to D- town. Daniel Hunter's so nice. <laughs> Let's just go to town. Let's and, fix it and for good. For anybody who's not aware, people, well, I brought it up before because technically he signed the exact same contract that Stefan Diggs did. It's a five-year, $72 million deal, and now they're kind of a year into it, and you'd be trading mm-hmm. for the exact same structure as what was left. And people are like, oh, he's not that good. He has more sacks than Jerry Hughes and he's 25. Yeah, no, Jerry he's Hughes really, is 32. Really like, you remember the Jerry Hughes seasons with Mario Williams and the oh, multiple... Yeah. Ten- Killer. He, Daniil Hunter has more sacks than Jerry Hughes and is 25 years old. That dude, Monster. he's a top five pass rusher in the NFL. If we could get... I, I'd give up our first round pick oh, for sure. Oh, I don't care. I wouldn't even care at all. Let's do that. Oh, and then, <laughs> then we'll have to give him more of the bucks. That's the all right. answer here. Pivoting to our next position here, maybe not quite as much money as the the edge rusher. Whisper sweet nothings to me about tight end Sterling. Oh man, so I'm gonna have to go with Jonu Smith, man. 
Uh, I know it's everybody's that's favorite. That's cheating. That's cheating. You Listen. know Greg loves him, and he's going to pick you because you said Janu. We got it. We got it. <laughs> he's got to pick me anyway just for diversity's sake, right? <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> no, I'm just playing, man. But Janu Smith, man, like, he's tied in one day from, from, from day one. If he comes here, I mean, I, he he – Athletic profiles through the roof. I mean, he, he could do multiple things. I mean, they pretty much used him as a, a blocker last year, and he he still was killing it. Uh, he, he had 112 passer rating when targeted last year, and this is in a run centric offense. So, I mean, this is a guy he can just simply ball out. I think he'd be great for for Dawson Knox. There's your veteran in the room. Um, but if I had to say, you know, give me somebody for uh, a value deal, give me Jared Cook. You know, he's old as hell. But he's a guy that <laughs> weird. But you know what's funny about him though? He he just gets touchdowns. Like the dude had eight touchdowns last year, tied for six in the league, uh, for for touchdowns for a tight end. So he'd be great for for a guy like Dawson Knox, Tommy Sweeney. Um, get great experience, and he you know still totally I'm, productive at thirty four. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely love that he can, he can he can find a zone and sit in it. You know he's great. Uh, you know between the ears, man. So that would be a great value signing in my opinion. Aaron, what's your plan for tight end? I won't be upset if we somehow get Smith, John Smith. I am not targeting him personally at all. I, I, I'm looking at – I want Carl, I want the top end of Carl Lawson. I don't want the top end of tight end. I, I just don't. I, I think Brandon Bean brought this up. One of us, whoever's playing Brandon Bean, uh, brought this up in the, the post game <laughs> in the end-of-season presser, and I think it got a little bit run with. I think people spiraled out of control that he was well, since he brought it up, this is going to be a huge priority for the Bills. I don't think it is still. I think that he brought it up in that the scheme needs to change a little bit. we got to do a little bit more with that. We need to develop Dawson Knox. Like Now is the time to develop Dawson Knox and the guy who we think he is. I'm with Eric on this one. I'm bringing in a guy like a Dan Arnold. I think running him with Knox, I'd be happy to draft the guy and have those three run it out here this year. I think t- take the kid from Notre Dame uh, and, and you add to the run blocking that you're going to lose with Lee Smith and that Dawson Knox hasn't quite picked up yet. I'm very conservative, I think, in, in my opinion, at tight end. I don't think all of a sudden we just had a record-breaking offense, uh, an offense like we haven't seen in 25 years here. I don't think all of a sudden they're going to come out and start targeting a real tight end one instead of Stephon Diggs or take those touches away from a Cole Beasley. I think the offense is going to stay pretty similar. They're going to try to scheme up some stuff outside of the red zone to get some tight ends going. But I think you can do that with Dan Arnold and Dawson Knox. Mm-hmm. I see development in Dawson Knox. I'm not panicking yet to fix the, this position and need one of the top guys in the league. Plus, I don't think that you get a top tight end until you fix the run game. I think we have to really attack the run game to open up these seams and, and get the type of plays that you see from the big tight ends around the league. So until we fix some of the stuff in the offense and the scheme itself, I'm not investing into this position like crazy. Anthony, what is your plan at tight end? This one is a conflicting one because, I, Greg, I believe you mentioned it. Ooh, something I, I heard you saying, it really clicked with me. What the Bills do at tight end this offseason is a very big indicator of how they view Dawson Knox going forward. It's a if test. You, totally. Yes. If you bring in John U. Smith, then it's like, all right, cool. So Dawson Knox is not the guy. Yep. That's the that that's what it is. If you bring in someone of value, then it's like, okay, we're still trying to let Knox develop. He's very raw. We're still letting him go through the process and see what's happening. Aaron's point is a key one for me with what the Bills did last year and how proficient they were and how strong they were on offense. How valuable is the tight end position in this offense when we're running a lot of 11 and a lot of 10 personnel? And is it something it it would be nice to have, but is it luxury? Is it a necessity? I recognize the mismatch potential. I like John U. Smith a lot. I like his ability to stretch the field. He has some home run potential as a tight end, and that's, that's very rare. He's someone who is still on the come up in terms of his development and where he is. I like him. I... I'm not going with him for my choice here. I'm going more of the value route as well, but it's not Dan Arnold. I'm going to go with Richard Rogers from (laughs) the Philadelphia Eagles. Someone who succeeded in green Bay. Yep. Succeeded in green Bay. He had a good year when called upon last year for Philly comes from a team in Philly who their base offensive personnel is 12 running with Ertz and Dallas Goddard. And then Ertz went down and it was Rogers and Goddard. And then Goddard went down 
and Richard Rodgers had several strong games. He had 28 targets on the year, 24 receptions. He's a guy who throughout his career, when targeted, his reception percentage is usually anywhere from 68 to 72%. He's not overly flashy. He's not going to cost a lot, and he's somebody who you can bring in And if you want to run a little more 12 personnel on the offense, he can very easily function into that role alongside Dawson Knox. Or if Knox still isn't hitting where you need him to, I'm comfortable with him stepping in and doing a better job, and we don't have to break the bank in order to have him do that better job. So for non-profiling reasons, I'll say that I'm Malik Boyd and Sterling is Brandon Bean. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Obviously, my heart wants to go with Sterling. I I love Jonu Smith. I think he would unlock a piece of this offense we haven't had. I have it in the back of my mind that I don't know that we ran 10 or 11 personnel because we were really good at it. Oh, good question. Or that we had the receivers and didn't have a tight end, so we had to run 10 and 11 personnel and ended up good at it. I don't know. Um, I don't have any evidence that it's not. Right. But now with John Brown gone... Wouldn't they like to have another weapon in the receiving game? Like, Gabe Davis was already a weapon in the receiving game. We need to replace that. I wonder if this is the route to replace that. And that if you, I don't think we're in on the Hunter Henry. I I honestly don't know that we're in at the end of the market that John Smith's going to get. I think rightfully he's going to get 8 million plus. I don't know that we're in on that. I do think maybe some of this veteran release market, a Kyle Rudolph, if Zach Ertz gets cut loose, one of those guys I could see. I think Jared Cook's not a bad short-term bandit. I think sure. that's a really intriguing one that might be a slight step up from a Dan Arnold, from a Richard Rodgers. I had mentioned uh, Trey Burton is probably in yep. that class as well. Um, similar to the discussions at other positions, I, I love – you know, Eric's kind of sold me on Dan Arnold. I think the age, the athleticism, the fact that he can kind of develop alongside Knox and they can yeah. kind of compete to be that top guy, but you can put them both out there if you want to. I think there's some intrigue there. So I'd love to see him a little more of an investment. I, the back of my, I can't shake it that I think it was talent driven that we didn't run more 12 personnel and have more uh, targets to the tight end. But I can't argue with the fact that they just didn't target the tight end. So maybe that's just not part of the Dable strategy, and he left that in New England. Um, but I'd love to see somebody in there that opens that up and gives him a chance to do it. Um, so I, I'd love to pick uh, John o. Smith because that's who I think would be the best fit. But I, I think more realistically, Brandon mm-hmm. Bean's probably going to go with a Dan Arnold, with a Richard Rodgers, with a Trey Burton at that lower yep. end of the market. All right, so uh, for we everybody listening... We were going to do linebacker, but... Yeah, we, yeah we, we had planned to do linebacker <laughs> at this point. Um, I'll ask the group, do you guys have anybody that still applies that would be interested in going after? I, or Not I'm now. assuming after Milano, that's no longer necessary. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it on the show too. You still have you're stuck with Klein, right? Like yes. he was yeah. part of that, so you're stuck with Klein. He's gonna go and he's a big back one to his role. The yeah. same one we saw with how they didn't really mess with Morris's restructure. They just did a pay cut or a right. you know shifting it to a bonus. Mm-hmm. Not messing with Klein means you can get out of it next year. Right. Yeah. If you do restructure it, that means we're signing up for this year and next year. I'd mm-hmm. rather take our medicine. Keep him as he's valuable depth. We saw flashes from him last year. Just take our medicine, and then we can move on next year and then deal with whoever the yeah. third linebacker and is. I don't Great. believe in injury prone, but Milano's got that label until he proves sure. otherwise. Yep. Right? That's right. So That's right. I have inclined. I'm com- com- super comfortable with that. I don't sleep on Tyrell Dotson either. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Well, he played, he played well. Yeah, honestly, and, now, and spot duty. I, now with adding Milano back, yeah. I'm, I'm almost now in the mindset of, I don't know that we need a linebacker. Yeah, I think we're no, good. I like, don't think so. I don't know that it, like it just hit plugs in at the top, and now with Edmonds, Milano, Klein, Matikevich, Dodson, Andre Smith, like back, we have baby. we have six <laughs> linebackers under contract right now. So short of something yeah. changing, those are six NFL caliber linebackers. Right. I, if we draft somebody, we're cutting a good linebacker. So I, not not that I'll be mad if we add a talent in the draft. That's always a great problem to have, but. Right now, we have six NFL caliber linebackers on the roster, with four of them being good special teams contributors. That's great. I'm I'm good at linebacker. Yeah. Same. Um, 
the, so the next position we did plan for is at cornerback. We'll let Anthony lead off this one. I'm curious to see the range you guys go in here. What is your plan at cornerback, Mr. Prohaska? So I believe Aaron and I spoke about this on Twitter several weeks back. I'm comfortable with the Levi Dane Jackson platoon. I'm fine with that. I And I really like Dane Jackson. I like his physicality. I like his aggressiveness. I like how he comes up. I like how physical he is at the point of attack in the run game and the, at the catch point in the passing game. However, neither of those address the speed issues at corner two that seem to have plagued the team against Kansas City. Now, I'm not for completely revamping everything because we have to be able to match Kansas City, but we do have to kind of match Kansas City, and that speed is a problem. And our defense, for as technically sound as it is and well-coached as it is, it's not an overly, aside from Milano and Edmonds, it's not overly speedy or tremendously athletic. And we we play those teams with that God-given, whether it's physicality or speed, we tend to struggle a little bit. So in looking at cornerback, and I also want to preface this, I don't know if it's necessarily in Bean's MO to address the corner position this offseason. Like they like having, I mean, we've all spoken about it at some point. They like just rolling with corner two as some scrappy dude from the late rounds or undrafted or on a cheapy deal and let them roll opposite a tray and they'll be okay. But I would like somebody that allows us to continue to maintain our coverage versatility on the back end, allow us to have a little more speed, a little more athleticism, disguise coverages and allow us to match up in different ways. My pick is William Jackson, corner from the Cincinnati Bengals. He's got some size. He's got length. He's got speed. He runs a 4-3-7-40. Last year, again, on a Bengals team that struggled, he had a 52.2 reception percentage allowed on 69 targets. For reference, Jair Alexander, Packers corner, who had an absolutely phenomenal year, arguably the best year for a corner in the NFL last year with Xavier Howard from Miami. Jair Alexander, who's regarded right now kind of as the best cover corner in the NFL, he was targeted 76 times and allowed receptions on 48.7% of his targets. So seven more targets, roughly 3% less in terms of receptions allowed. William Jackson had a very sneaky, quiet, good year last year with his length, his ability to play man, his ability to function in zone. I like the dynamic that he adds to the defense. I also think we can get him at a decently affordable rate. Spot track, again, although it's not the Bible, as Greg mentioned, his spot track average annual value is pegged at 6.3 right now. I do think it's going to be higher than that, but the versatility Man, we talk about it with Hyde and Poyer all the time. Both of them are so interchangeable and allow the defense to do so many things. Having a guy like William Jackson opposite of Trey, I think it takes our secondary to another level, takes our defense as a whole to another level because of the athleticism, the speed, the length, and the ability to play multiple coverages on the back end. Very interesting. I like it. Aaron, where are you at with cornerback? Anthony just took my pitch and totally crushed it. Uh, Yeah, I, I feel similar this it's funny because it's another bangle i feel similar as i feel defensive end as you go all in on a guy like a william jackson and it the, you're not even going all in at this what spot track saying the value is and i do agree it's probably going to be a little bit higher than where they're at but i'm okay with that i think if you're trying to finally address cornerback two uh which we've seen now for three or four years they've been trying to replace levi wallace really make that attempt don't do any more of this get a Kevin Johnson and let him and Levi compete. Either go out and get a guy or keep running back. I'm, I am happy to bring back Levi and draft some other guy to compete with him and allow him Dane and a, and a first or a second, third round pick all kind of fight it out this summer and see how that goes. Uh, but if you really want to address cornerback too, and I, and I would like to get past this and for all the reasons that Anthony mentioned, I would like to have multiple coverages that you can throw at teams and not just have to, you know, against the speedy team, be stuck in zone and not be able to man up and get in people's faces. I think it does take your defense to a whole nother level. There's not going to be many types of free agent moves or acquisitions that this team can do that can really take this. This defense has every layer has playmakers. So you're not going to be able to just put somebody in that's going to take it to another level. I really do think uh, that William Jackson takes this defense to an entirely another level and maintains it as a top five defense, which is really hard to do year in and year out. So I'm all in on on that move. And if we can't do it, again, I'm I'm going the conservative route. Let's bring Levi back cheap, draft a guy, 
and, and allow the iron sharpens iron thing to work itself out. <laughs> tough, tough, tough to go up against this, Sterling. What you got? So I'm going to go uh, scrap it all, okay, because we kind of uh, – we, we think the same way about the cornerback position. Um, but, you know, this is one thing that we also have to keep in mind is that this is McDermott's baby, like the cornerback, the secondary position. So he, I think, unlike a lot of coaches, he can get the most out of these guys, and he's shown and he's proven that. So my dream will be Patrick Peterson, right? I would love, I would love to have him, but that ain't gonna happen. But I'm gonna go with Kevin King, and let me tell you, tell you why I'm Kevin King. Now, this is a guy that missed 33 games in his little four-year career, but 2019 he was a straight baller. Okay, he had like 15 pass defense, five picks. He's six foot three. I mean, he gives you that size and speed and versatility that this defense needs to be able to run foot for foot with somebody. And I think you know, we all know what uh, what, who's a defense coordinator, in Green Bay, um, Patton. Yeah, I, we, all, we know what he's about. I just think that McDermott can unlock some things, and, and and Kevin King, and I would bring back Kevin Johnson on a really cheap deal. I mean, that gives you some of that athleticism to be able to man up with with teams like Kansas City. So that's what I would do. I I like it a lot. It, now William Jackson is a great call. I think that he sure. is a very reasonable target because I don't think he's going to get quite the money that some of the guys at the top end are going to get. I've seen some, but I, I think he's probably a better fit than maybe an AJ Boye. Um, there's a couple names that, that I'm intrigued by that, that I think Jason Verrett is interesting. Yeah. Um, for the same reason you brought up Kevin King, very similarly, I like Akella Witherspoon from yeah, San Francisco. Yeah. Similar yeah. length, reach, speed. Um, another one, if, if we're going to go the reclamation route, of a high-end talent to see if you could have McDermott and our secondary coaches unlock something. Maybe Gary and Conley is that mm-hmm. kind of guy. Like if we yeah. don't spend money, yeah. you, you go and get a former high-end pick with elite athleticism that hasn't been able to put it together. Maybe that's the combination that rather than getting the most out of an undrafted free agent, seventh round pick, Dane Jackson, uh, Levi Wallace, maybe the next level for, for him is go get a reclamation project of a former first round pick that you can now unlock what his potential was and have the elite, elite athleticism. Yeah. So whether that's a guy like Jackson, I, I think is a great call. I think you'll pay a little bit for it, but if we had to go even seven or eight million, I, I wouldn't hate that for Jackson. Mm-hmm. I love the six million projection in spot track. Um, but if we were going to go that route, I, I want athleticism. If we're going to add yeah. someone, adding another – I know people love Richard Sherman. I like Richard Sherman. I would love to have him in our locker room. I don't know at this point in his career that he adds a ton that Levi Wallace or Dane Jackson don't right. on the field. Like He will make some heady plays that they can't because he's just right. going to know more about the other quarterbacks. I don't know in the games that I'm worried about he makes a material difference in what they do. He would just make me feel better in most of the other games, and he'll make some. He will look really good against the bad quarterbacks that he's yeah. going to break on and read and make the good plays right. against. I don't know that he makes the difference against the guys we play in the playoffs when, when we're going to need it. Uh, so I'd love a William Jackson and some of the other guys. I just want to lean athleticism with, with yeah. whatever one we go to. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. No. What? All right, I'm out. Denied. <laughs> we <move on. laughs> would you rather to to the panel here? Would you rather give eight million a year for Johnu Smith or eight million a year for William Jackson? William no, Jackson. Jackson. William Jackson. Absolutely. Stopping other teams from passing. Yeah, I, more along the same lines, our friend Anthony Marino over at uh, Breaking Buffalo Rumblings uh, put up a post of Johnu Smith or Carl Lawson, and I said, "Listen." I'm like the president of the John U. Smith fan club. Anybody who voted John U. Smith wins. Yeah, you're not allowed to be my <laughs> friend anymore. Like, if, if you'd rather have John U. Smith than Carl Lawson, like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> it's a tight end. Like, they just don't matter that nearly as much as a pass rusher. Um, so, yeah, if uh, same way, I, I would love. Uh, if you can't and, rush him, you got to cover him. You know, <laughs> true. Um, true. So yeah, yeah I would true. much rather spend money at premium positions and be able to invest that money there and, and, and figure out a way to do that. Um, our last position for tonight is one that we debated whether to bring onto the show or not, and I think that we all agree we are going to add talent at this position. It's just curious where and at what level, and whether the draft or the free agency. We'll start with Sterling. 
Wait, what is what, what Ryan you can Fitzpatrick? Can do backup quarterback if you yeah, guys no, no, want. No. Yeah, <laughs> wait, we can time. talk about that. Um, Sterling, what is your case for running back for the Buffalo Bills? Man, we need some more versatility and speed. We all know that. So Matt Breida would be my my choice. Nice. You know, I think he's he's solid. Or Kenyon Drake, if you want to spend a little bit, you know, four or five million mm-hmm. a year. Talk in Aaron's language. I'll take King and Drake. Six foot one can run. He, I mean, he's very versatile. I mean, those are two guys that I'm I'm looking at. I keep that short. Anthony, what is your plan for running back? Uh, Travis Etienne. No. Yeah, um, yeah. I, <laughs> I, 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 I I I will lose my mind if we take a running back and pick thirty. Watching him run his forty, he was going full speed. One yard into his forty yard dash, yeah, like it was on. Un- How do you get going that fast that quickly? I don't under. He was shot out of a cannon and just boom. I I don't understand the physics of how he was going that fast that quickly. I yeah. man, it was so impressive to watch him run that forty, as is his tape and just watching oh, him his crunchy. highlight you reels. See, crazy. Yeah. Every time he touches the ball, every time he's on the field, even when I've never, I don't want to say never, but. I, I've almost never been as impressed with a running back just gaining like three yards as I am Wait, with Travis just Etienne. St- stand up and show your jersey. Oh yeah, it's so the Oklahoma State Barry Sanders jersey. <laughs> yeah, he, he had a yeah. couple of those. Yeah. Little, yeah, I mean, I guess he was like all right, but I mean, Barry Sanders played on a ton of great Lions teams that always gave him a ton yeah, of right. support. So he was really like the product of a great team. Um, shout out to Scott Mitchell. I like what ETN does, or and just in that mold of like, if we had a number one running back who could do everything, who had power and balance and vision and could catch and run routes and do all that home run threat, I would love all that. I think it'd be fantastic. But with the makeup of this team and the other needs that are present, I don't think we can afford to spend high money in free agency, which I definitely don't think we will. I've, I've seen some people be like, oh, let's look at Aaron Jones. No, not going to happen. Right. <laughs> and I recognize the Najee Harris and the ETN talk, and I think that would be fun. But I also think that's a high sacrifice of draft capital and a fifth-year option to take somebody in the first round. Even if you trade back into the second, I recognize that it changes the value proposition a little bit, but it's still high. I'm on the Sterling model for this, bringing in somebody who adds another dynamic to the offense. I want James White. I want someone who adds mismatch opportunity coming out of the backfield. He is one of the best route runners in the NFL for, oh, there you go, Cole. We're on the same page. Somebody who... I think that's Eric's pick too. Oh, I like that. That would make sense. He He's arguably the best route running running back in the NFL, he just he runs those Camara style routes, but he's been doing it longer. So really, Camara runs those James White style routes, yes. where yes. it comes out of the backfield, runs those options. He can beat linebackers inside, outside. You can line him up and flank him out wide. You can put him in the slot. He can also carry it a bit. He's had a couple seasons where he's done a lot, and he's had a hundred catch season. He's had a nine hundred receiving yard year, a seven hundred receiving yard year, and when you add him to the backfield that we already have. Singletary and Moss. I just think with what we invested in them and the success that they've had, I know 2020 was rough for the run game, but I think it was more O-line related than it was running back related. I don't see Singletary and Moss necessarily going anywhere. So in order to supplement that group, you got to bring in someone that's affordable. You can get James White. His average annual value as Peg right now in spot track is three mil. I think you can get him for something around there. He's coming off of a four year uh, or a four million average annual value deal with New England. Let him run those option routes out of the backfield. Get you some cheap yards. I think he'd be an awesome dynamic. Great hands. A nice little added security blanket. Third down weapon who can also carry the ball a bit. Aaron, I know you're going to go with Christian Wade, but besides that, what <laughs> yeah. is your other choice? <laughs> Uh, so you guys nailed a couple of them. James White, I think, is the mold of how I envision the need at that position for this offense. I, I think he would be perfect fit uh, if that's who they can get. I think there are going to be some top teams competing for that role. I think the Packers are going to be in competition for James White services. Mm. So I think you're going to be battling with some other high end teams for a vet like that who has a winning pedigree can come in and do all the things that Anthony said. That's the need for the Bills offense. Some other guys, I do love Kenyon Drake, uh, and I've been on that for years, but I don't like him as a fit here for Buffalo because I think I actually think he's one of the most underutilized backs in the league. I think he needs more touches than we can give him because I, I do think Moss and Singletary are still a huge part of this going forward where you're really looking for a supplemental piece. So I, I don't know that Drake would fit because he 
he seems to be a kind of guy that would be more productive as a feature or part of a feature than that third down guy. Duke Johnson maybe could be a guy. I, I like him as well. He can do some things out of the backfield. Brita, I love that speed. I, I think that Dable could do a ton with that speed and turn him into more of a receiving back as well. Uh, real cheap deal. This is a guy I liked a couple off seasons ago. Hasn't done much. I, I feel like everywhere he goes, coaches don't know how to use him. Ty Montgomery. Uh, he mm-hmm. has a pedigree of being able to wa- line up outside. He, he's been a wide receiver. He was drafted as a wide receiver. Has the ability to do some in the run game. Has played some special teams. That could be a really cheap value. He, he might be on his way out of the NFL here soon if yeah. somebody doesn't figure out how to use him. Everywhere he goes, he doesn't get used. So you might be able to get some real good value there and sort of replace the Yeldon role with a guy like that. But that's where I'm shopping is at the bottom. And something, Greg, you and I have talked about, I don't know where you line him up. You could be a wide receiver or a running back, but a Cordell Patterson. And then you're able to Mm. merge that role of the Andre Roberts, the Isaiah McKenzie running back three into this one person. You save all those salaries and you have a weapon that you just try to find ways to get the ball. So I think they add somebody, but I think it's at the low end of free agency. Yeah, that's my favorite combination. I, I'd love to go the Cordero Patterson or the Jamal Agnew role where it's right. returner, third running back, special teams guy, sneaky third running back, special teams guy, Rex Burkhead. Sure. Um, yeah. He plays special teams, gets a lot of special team snaps. I think it's most likely that it's the Yeldon <laughs> slight upgrade, but the challenge is if you get a better – like James White, you're not paying that money to then be inactive on game day. Mm-hmm. So our third running back was inactive a lot of game days. So then it's interesting. I think Duke Johnson could be that. I think that Chris Thompson could be that. I think Jarek McKinnon could be that. Um, but I like Mike Davis, what he did in Carolina when Christian yeah. McCaffrey was out. Some yeah. of those guys I think are going to get paid to play. James White's mm-hmm. not going to sign somewhere that he's not going right. to be active on game totally. day. Um, so if you do that, you're talking about – do we then sit Devin Singletary and go James White and Zach Moss? I, I just don't know if that combination exists. So I like the idea of a guy who can be active on game day and contribute. Ideally, that's a Jamal Agnew quarter Cordero Patterson. I think a sneaky one that I could see McDermott falling for would be a Rex Burkett, a guy that plays special teams. You can have him active, but he's also the third running back and that you'd basically take Taiwan Jones and TJ Yeldon into one rather than Isaiah McKenzie or Andre Roberts. Um, so we'll, we'll see where that goes. I think it's interesting. I also think a mid-run pick is also in play sure. that you just keep yeah. you know, churning away at those kind of things. And I will say, uh, for what uh, anybody who didn't check it out, go listen on Monday. I did the Reddit mock off uh, offseason with the guys who ran that for the Bills uh, over their entire setup. With where it happened, they brought up the example last year. Everybody thought that Jonathan Taylor and J.K. Dobbins and everybody was going to go earlier, and they fell a lot longer than what mm-hmm. people thought. They got Travis Etienne at pick sixty-one in that mock draft, and that was that's not a simulator. That's oh, you know thirty-two groups making picks on behalf of each team, knowing their needs, knowing what was there. They got Travis Etienne at pick sixty-one. You're telling me we could get him at pick sixty-one? I'm a hundred percent on board. You tell me we get an offensive lineman or a pass rusher or a cornerback or a premium position to pick 30, and then Etienne at pick 61? I'm for I, it. I, I would say some inappropriate words if, if we had that It'd come would be super aboard. inappropriate. I would like to go on record with all you beautiful gentlemen here that if they ended up even at 30 with Etienne or Harris, like, I might be a little upset for a second, but I'm not going to be mad to add really mm-hmm. good I'd soothe football. myself by watching their highlight reel. Yeah, and you're going to add top <laughs> football players to this team that was already just yeah. in the AFC championship game. I just want to add good football players and let the coaches figure yeah. this out. So well, the people that are, I, I think there's just some too much rig, rigid ideas that you can't do this and you right, can't do that. Right, I just right. want good football players. So I'm on the record that come to my mentions if that happens. I will, I will be there to soothe you and get you through it. Well, hey. here, let, let's go through the offseason we just put together. You guys pitched me on we re-signed Daryl Williams, we signed Carl Lawson, we go get Dan Arnold, we sign William Jackson. Well, then all of a sudden you can draft Travis Etienne because yeah. we just filled every single hole. That's that's the money thing right there. But... <laughs> yeah, that's true. That, but that's the thing. Like, if we are, if we're using free agency, whether it's a combination of like higher money guys or value guys and filling those holes, then you're looking at the first round and being like, okay, we're kind of back to our best player available type motto. 
And there's a chance where that best player available is Travis Etienne or Najee Harris or someone that maybe it might seem like a luxury, but it's the best player and the upgrade, even though it's not at a high necessary positional value need, but the upgrade it is worth the return much. on investment. Yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. just too good to pass up. So I think that's definitely a possibility, especially if they, like we laid out here in this episode, Greg, you were spot on. If they're able to address the other areas of priority that we've laid out, then you can go into the first round instead of being like, Oh my God, we got to get this position. Then it's kind of back to what we like to do, which is just, well, if we can get this guy, it'd be cool, but we're looking at BPA and BPA at the back end of the first round might be a running back. And when well, you, you have all your bills paid, you can buy shit you don't need. Yeah, yeah, like, that's go. just how it works. There you go. Well, uh, I love it. I love garbage out bringing awesome up analogy. Demetric Felton. Um, the guys over at the cover one draft oh. show did a breakdown of uh, CJ Maribel. Some of those guys, that could be the route that you go to be. Who's the North Texas uh, kind of receiver, running back, returner guy that everybody likes? I, uh, I can't remember. Oh, his name. I forget his name. I can see his face. Uh, darn, uh, darn it. Darn, I'll think of it. Jalen Darden? Yes, Darden. There you go. Um, yeah. So those kind of guys, maybe that's the draft investment is that he they, they bring in one of those guys that's one of the, you know, I think some people mm-hmm. like. Rondell Moore, some people like Elijah Moore. Maybe they go with one of those guys who are kind of the modern. Um, we didn't go into it tonight because I don't think we're going to spend a wide receiver. But I did make the pitch at one point that if you really wanted a fancy version of John Brown, Isaiah McKenzie, and Andre Roberts, just go spend some money on Curtis Samuel and let let me have that as your third your third running back, your yeah. jet, your jet sweep guy, your returner, and your deep threat. He's going to get. Paid. He's gonna get so much money. Yeah. He's way gonna get off. so yeah. much He's money. Yeah. So much money. He's gonna get so much money. So, um, so I, I do think it's exciting. I, I appreciate you know everything you guys had. One position I'm gonna throw out there because we didn't really bring it up, but say we do go the draft route at tackle, maybe we spend a little money. Do you guys have any ideas in the guard market that interest you? In free agency. Yeah, so some of the releases recently, Gabe, yeah. Jackson, Gabe Jackson got released. Right. Uh, Kevin Zeitler got released. Mm-hmm. That's it looks me. very That's interesting. Um, you know, obviously the chance to bring back Feliciano. Uh, you could bring back Richie Incognito if if he's mm-hmm. you know you're talking about age 38, but he was really good the last time he was on a football he's field. Still good. Um, uh, Kevin Zeitler's very interesting. To yeah, me. I'm into that. He's been really good. I think that could be an interesting market. I think all those guys being released does not help John Feliciano's market. I think there's a chance you could really upgrade at guard if they were to sign, if they were to sign a Zeitler and then a Rick Wagner or a a CJ, Mm -hmm. you know, a a Bugbe, one of those kind of guys that are more of a band aid at tackle, knowing that hey, that means the first or the second round pick is going to be a tackle, right? I'd feel okay. I'd feel okay going in with that, that you have Ryan Bates, CJ Bucky, and whoever our top two round picks are at tackle and figure out how that works. Um, any other names, uh, Sterling, that stick out to you at guard? Uh, Gabe Jackson. I mean, yeah. how awesome would His- that be? History guy? with Bobby Johnson? Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that I don't, I mean, I think we say it, but I don't think we really believe it, but I think it's a real thing. You know what I'm saying? I think it's a real thing that Gabe Jackson could be a Buffalo Bill yeah. just based on familiarity alone. Um, I, I'm okay with bringing back Ryan Groy as a, as a swing guy, you know, as a, just a, for a solid depth. Um, I know he kind of flamed out in uh, the chargers, but I mean, he never really had a high ceiling, but I think he's a guy that can come in and just get the job done. If you had to put a bandaid there, I mean, hell we, taught it out brian winters for crying out loud i mean uh, along those lines i care about bringing back ike bacher like i yeah. i don't i don't want to pay him real money but i want him on the roster yeah you need right. those guys yeah 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 Aaron i want to tag it in the draft second. yeah i, I want to tag it in the draft still a little bit uh and I, i'm low on feliciano man yeah, I, me I think too. If, me too. if we're bringing I mean, back feliciano it's got to be no. for that versatility on a low and i think he's a low end st- average person i think he's not too high up from brian winters he I mean, was I think... paid right before when it was yep. two years yes. and seven yep. million he, that he right. was paid correctly i agree and i think if you can get him back it's kind of same in that market value sure bring him back as a swing guy but i don't want him as part of the starting rotation going yeah. forward i'd like to address it in the draft and i and i'd love to bring in one of these bigger names at that yeah. position yeah. I, I think that's the way to go looking at like <clears throat> especially with all these guys that are getting released like 
and the potential trade options as well, whether it's Norwell, Zeitler's free, uh, right. Trey Turner from the Chargers. If, if Norwell gets released, he's right there behind Zeitler for now. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Right absolutely. Right. I, I would love to kick the tires on any of those possibilities. And if it's not, if it's not one of them, like I, I, I'm on that same boat. I love, I love Feliciano's mentality and his attitude and yeah, talking about all that. He's great on Twitter. But, yeah. Yep. But his on-field production just isn't there for me in terms of what I want. And his his best asset is a run blocker. And even if you diagnose the tape and really break it down, he didn't have a very successful past couple of years, especially 2020. If yeah. we're not getting the Norwells, Zeitlers of the free agent aspect, I'm looking right towards the draft. I And then I'm praying Elijah Vera Tucker falls or... Or I'm looking at uh, Wyatt Quinn, Davis. Quinn Miners in the second round. Quinn Miners fr- yeah. uh, from yeah. Wisconsin Whitewater. Who's I want that belly sticking out. I want the crop top. Dude, yes, yes. Yes. In a Bills yes. training give camp. Me, give it. me that. Give me Elijah Vera Tucker, Quinn Miners, Wyatt Davis, Landon Dickerson. Even if you sure. want to take Creed Humphrey and try sure. him out there. There's a lot of second round. Dickerson round and Humphrey. Value. I love the idea of them sure. as a guard yep. in the first year and yep. long-term replacement yep. for Mitch Morris. For Mitch I Morris, love that idea. That's fantastic. Give me – I think that's a big – thing like the tackle issue or the tackle position is the sexier option and with how the first round is going to shake out there's a chance somebody can really fall and also vera tucker could potentially kick out to tackle that's a possibility sure. Sure. but like, if i could guarantee right now tevin jenkins falls to 30 give me tevin oh, jenkins at 30 right, yeah, right now yep it's i'm taking that dude. right now and, and he looked but he <laughs> He's so mean and nasty, but his headshot looks like he's going to be in Gryffindor for Harry Potter. Like, That's like just, you, though. You guys have that same thing going. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm a oh, – dude, I'm a dog. You got no yeah. idea. This little Christmas tree behind me and the Walt Disney World picture up there, it's all misleading and misdirection on purpose. <laughs> right. And, yeah, like, that guard position, though, is – that interior line – it was bad last year and it affected yeah. Mitch Morse and it affected the style of running offense we had with having to dramatically shift to a zone scheme instead they of they couldn't cap pull Morse because we couldn't afford Correct. to le- not have him standing there. Correct. And nope. he's a fantastic pin and pull center. So addressing that interior O line, and especially if we're gonna pencil Cody Ford in at left guard, which is what it kind of looks like, then I think we need to have a stud at right guard, whether it's free agency or looking towards the draft. Luckily, whether it's the open market or the draft, there's a lot of depth and okay. saturation at that yeah. position in terms you of you can make up for one week link. Like you can yes. put Cody Ford out there and make up for it if you've got everything else solid. Correct. You can make up for like what they had last year with Weak links on every four day center. Like, right. You can't do yeah. that. No. Yeah. no, can't do it. We can't get away with that again. Oh. All right, guys. We have made it. We are finally here to where transactions are starting to happen and we are going to have new Buffalo Bills on the roster the next time Ooh. that you see any of us. Uh, for our reminders for everyone, uh, we now have the salary cap. It's at $182.5 million. The Bills have made moves. They released Quentin Jefferson. They released John Brown. They re-signed Matt Milano. They restructured deals or could, got pay cuts from Vernon Butler and Mitch Morris. Uh, I project that we're going to see something over the next couple of days of a nice ceremonial retirement for Lee Smith. Uh, they, they do have to make a move before the 21st because he is owed a roster bonus. So at some point here... They're going to have to be able to do that. There's also some other uh, guys coming up on the 21st. If they go after a Carl Lawson, a Hassan Reddick, or Romeo Aquara, they need to lock that up before the 21st because there's another nearly million-dollar roster bonus due to Mario Addison and a chunk of his uh, contract that guarantees. So if they're going to cut him, they have to do that before the 21st. There's a handful of other guys that don't really come into play too much, uh, but that date is a big one that uh, the – Brandon Bean uses fifth day of the new league year as his standard for this reason. So you have options to make moves. So there's a couple other things to watch for. Um, and then we'll see what falls uh, elsewhere. But um, we'll go around the horn here. Uh, Anthony and Sterling, make sure you let the people know where they can see from you next week and what kind of stuff you guys will have going on. Uh, but we'll start with Aaron. Where can the people find you and what do you have going on? Nah, just leave me alone for the next couple of weeks. I don't want you guys in my mention. No, nah, you can find me at Aaron Quinn 716. Always looking to have some fun. Uh, Sterling, tell the people where to find your good work. Uh, you know, it's the Hoof Podcast. Uh, we're going to have Joe Maroon on our, our live show on Tuesday. Beautiful. So nice. that'll be fun. So at Forward Sterling on Twitter is where you can find me. Awesome, awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. Anthony? Find me on Twitter at pro underscore underscore ant. Pro two underscores A N T. Find disguise coverage live every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Part of Cover One Sports. Except for next week, 
I'll be going live on Monday That's to right. recap. Hopefully yeah. reacting yeah. to some fun action Hopefully. that took Stephane place on the first day. Stephane Diggs Jackson. was traded on the Monday last year. So, yeah, it's yeah. a big uh, big thing. And apparently I'm also now the Tevin Jenkins of this group as dubbed <laughs> by Aaron. So there we go. That's what I am. <laughs> I like it. I, 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 he's called nasty me worse guy. things already he's today. He's just a nasty dude. <laughs> All right, guys, you can find me at Greg Thompson on the Twitter machine and having fun with everybody here on the overall Cover One network. Come and find us at the Cover One Slack channel. Become a premium member. Come and hang out. Give us a rating. Give us a review. Give us a like. Go. Uh, make sure you subscribe to The Hoof. Subscribe to Disguise Coverage. It's really what helps us out here. We appreciate it. On behalf of Aaron Quinn, Sterling, Anthony, you have been listening to Cover One Buffalo, and we are out.